architecture of today entitled marginal environmentalism local environmental activism and global trends in the european neighborhood art the transnational political extension in europe common network so i'm happy to have here some of the partners dealing with the environment and so i will introduce to you aaron muzogani our first speaker who is assistant professor at the Boko University of Vienna, Austria, and he is dealing with the topic of uh, European Union environmental policy making, civil society and environmental organization in the European context, and climate justice movement. Then we will have our two speakers from the team of Bel Belgrade. Uh, one is here in person, so we have Jelena Pesic, assistant professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Belgrade, who works on uh, collective action and social movements, and in the field of the environment also. And we have online Elisabetta Petrovic, assistant professor also of the Department of Sociology at the University of Belgrade. And she's also dealing with environmental activism and other forms of civic engagement, in particular social movements. So I'm really glad and honored to have them here and uh, that you can listen to the presentation of some of the findings of this research of the Krapoko Network, but also uh, they are building on their expertise on this. So I will leave the floor for Aaron to start, then Elisabetta and Jelena will continue, and then there will be the Q&A session. Aaron, the floor is yours, and I will... Now it's on again. Okay, so hello and welcome, and thanks for, for coming, um, and thanks for um, inviting us. Um, I'm sort of a bit short, so I'm not, not really sure how to how to do this, or maybe I'm, if I'm standing, is that better? Yeah, but yeah, or I just sit a bit here, and then you, you at least we can we have some some eye contact. Hello. So, so um, yes. Yeah, so what what I'm I'm presenting uh, here is, is basically something more on on like another research project or a paper per se, but I'm, I'm trying to to bring together um, basically several years of, of research on environmentalism, and we call this with uh, with Chiara marginal environmentalism, um, and I will try to tell you why what the idea was, um, as I remember, with this marginal environmentalism thing. Um, so basically, what how we divided it up uh, today is that um, I am the, the sort of the, the band playing before the the main gig, and uh, um, so th those these band pre bands uh, um, before the headliners are uh, either have the role of uh, you know making you very hot uh, for the for the main act, or or just you know making you hope that it's 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 very fast over uh, that the main act can start, um, but. Basically, what I, I, I would try to do is, is to, to introduce um, several, some conceptual uh, ideas and also some, maybe some more general problems. I, I, I have also some empirical stuff, but I probably won't really get, uh, have not so much time to get into that. But we saw together that, that we, uh, what, what we do is, is, is sort of talking to each other. And so some of the empirics will um, sort of, um, Build on 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 that, or at least you, it will be your task to find out how the, how those things are relating to each other. So, what is this marginal environmentalism? It could be basically um, mean two two different things. Um, so it could mean, on the one hand, something that there there is a weak environmental movement somewhere, um, so, um, and and but on the other hand, it can have a, a geographical aspect. So it's a uh, um, Something which in political economy, rather, um, uh, you would call like peripheral uh, in a peripheral location, so peripheral Europe, for example. Um, and you saw it in my uh, subtitle there that I'm dealing with the European neighborhood. Um, so it's it, more general. It's it's more about Eastern Europe. Um, I will talk also about countries which are now still in the European periphery, but within the European um, Union, because this is basically where my empirical expertise is coming from. But what my overall um, 
frame framing of the issue is is something which is maybe more interesting for those of you who are not specifically focusing on environment. Um, and this is about external influences and transnationalism. Transnationalism being, um, um, as I heard, the topic also of this discourse. Um, and I also know that some of you, at least, are, are, are working on, on issues related to environment. And uh, we will meet uh, many of you um, in, in Vienna. Um, and this, this fall, there is this, this workshop where, or a conference uh, we are organizing in the framework of, of this project. But uh, let, let, let me give this, this basically this first conceptual introduction into, um, into external influences and how civil society um, is, uh, is influenced or how can we um, look at that. But first, um, what I, I'm, I will sort of try to prove my street credibility in a sense to say that, say that okay, like this, these are the cases I'm, I'm draw, drawing on and I will, if you have a bit of time left in the end, I will, I will go more into detail. But maybe this, is, this can be read also a bit like a um, sort of a, a research CV, like what kind of stuff did this guy work on. And um, so I, I did a PhD and in, basically it was um, on, on the Europeanization of uh, environmental governance during the accession process. So I was looking at the implementation of EU directives in, uh, in East European countries when or at the time when they basically were entered, when they entered uh, the EU, so shortly before and then afterwards. Um, and and this, is, this is basically something which is in, in public policy research. So it, Originally, it didn't really have that much to do with with, with, with social movements, uh, but that that emerged as a as a very important aspect, um, which I didn't really follow in in my PhD in the end. But I I, I was sort of um, having large sympathies um, uh, with, with 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 this research track, and uh, actually know some of the people here, like Lorenzo from many many years ago, uh, where when we were first. Um, Presenting these things. So, um, and so other um, research I've been involved, uh, and that that is really talking to uh, what we were here in the in the main act today is uh, is, is a, um, like an anti mining movement uh, in Romania, which was also very interestingly framed during the uh, accession uh, process, the so called Save, Save um, um, movement, and and then. As time went by and these countries became EU members, I, I, I was more working on, on, on a neighborhood policy. So it would be the countries which are, which are in Eastern Europe but never had, or let's see what happens, but they, they had no, no, no direct access um, option. So mainly Ukraine, Georgia, and also Moldova a bit. Um, and, and basically there I tried to look what, what this Europeanization process, how it looks like. Um, and, um, and and basically how, how environmental NGOs are are working in the, in in those contexts. And the last aspect, that sort of vignette, I'm I will uh, I'm drawing on and I will uh, try to to introduce in the end is is something more recent. And this is also the question on how, on how environmentalism or environmental mobilization can work under conditions of illiberalism. Um, so this is. Um, where we where we look with colleagues at urban conflicts happening in in Hungary, um, so this is one part of the work I'm doing in this this field, and this is on on what I will draw uh, draw for 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 this presentation. Maybe good good to know, or uh, as a sort of a side remark, I'm much of the work I'm now doing is more on climate mobilization, protest participation with Fridays for Future, anti coal movement. And the Galende, so more Germany focused, or Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion. So these are those groups, and I, I we, we just met with some, with one of you who were, or also we knew each other from, from other meetings, more on this climate issue. And and basically the main um, project I'm now involved is is um, is to look at the Austrian Climate Citizen Assembly, which can be seen as also related to um, to, to 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 movement goals so this is something which the austrian climate movement was pushing and now it's really happening so the next week will be the last meeting um, and we are evaluating this for uh, for, the, for the european climate fund 
Okay, but this is just a bit of the background of saying saying who I am in terms of research, um, and maybe this 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 is already also showing you like where which kind of perspectives can can be um, can be placed on, on on this research, and and this is probably fair to say that I'm not not only in uh, <laughs> like in, in in this social movement working from this social movements perspective, but I'm much of the work I'm, I'm doing it's it's from from a public policy perspective. So those are those people who are looking at environmental governance, doing like you know like all these advocacy coalitions, theories, and multiple streams, and questions like you know lo lobbying and civil society and how this works together. But there is also, of course, uh, if you look look so that something abroad, there there is also an international aspect, and you can also say that there is an IR perspective to 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 NGOs and uh, and. Maybe that, that that becomes more more clear if you if if you look at EU studies where this this perspective is also very very strong. Um, so in in a sense, um, yes, ex external or transnational perspective, very strongly embedded in this international perspective. NGOs being internationally active actors, and then there is so of course the perspective of so, of social movement studies, which uh, I assume somehow that that uh, here you you hear in uh, SNS are are much in in that, um, so I, I'm, I'm, I will try to connect this to to uh, to some of the stuff I'm I'm doing, um, and maybe as a final literature, which is, which I'm I think I'm I should flag flag out is is sort of the third sector research, which is more interested in in organizations. So it, it's not only about social movements uh, or campaigns or so on, but it looks at at at, at these groups as organizations and also using very often organization theory. So this is very much a management perspective and or public administration related issue. But I I, I worked for quite some years in a public administration school, so I, I got somehow influenced by by this. And I think by now that this is really something where that also social movement scholars should use more like this strong, strongly organizational perspective. So, um, if you look at ex external influences, how could we frame this in terms of um, of, of literature? And and I, I'm I'm just trying to put in, in in this presentation also a lot of footnotes or, or, or literature references, um, maybe because I'm I'm not not sure how familiar you are you with this literature, but I'm trying to 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 basically to to walk you through basically two literatures uh, on on external influences, and maybe some of you can use that uh, in 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 your work. Um, or, or find uh, at least some some ideas. So, basically, in the 90s, um, we had uh, had a big um, um, was a bit a big fashion to to look at the external promotion of, of policies. Of course, it's fair to say much before that as well. But that that it was then when when it this after the end of Cold War, this this research on this and and practical um, policies got really big. So human rights. Um, democratization, so external democratization became very important aspects with um, foreign policy makers were, were wanting to do, development aid makers were do, wanting to do, and of course a lot of international organizations were doing in practice. So this EU being one of them, but uh, of course not limited to this. Uh, so bringing policies to, to other countries in terms of development aid uh, was one important thing. Um, and in in, term, in terms of international relations, so this this has uh, had has a huge literature. So basically, the idea how norms can be um, um, transferred and how NGOs can what can NGOs can play, uh, uh, what role can they play here? And and there is this famous article uh, by by Risa and others where where they say that basically NGOs are those who who can throw the boomerang. So they talk, they talk about the boomerang effect, basically meaning that uh, NGOs on the National level can throw that that boomerang around the nation state and hit it again, and this is how uh, they can basically um, push countries to towards norm adoption. They made this uh, up with uh, on, on examples and with human rights policy in Indonesia, um, but basically this model can be applied um, everywhere. Um, then I would say 
bit later in the 2000s or maybe end of 90s already, it, it became increasingly obvious that, well, this model is really nice, but it's not doesn't work then that that easily uh, in all kinds of contexts. Uh, so it's particularly uh, problematic in authoritarian states where where you just do not necessarily have that clear division between states, state and society. Um, and there, um, Daniel Lewis has a very uh, good overview article on this and saying like, well, basically state society relations in authoritarian uh, states are characterized by cooperation, contestation and discourse. So, so it's, it's sometimes these are gongos, sometimes they are NGOs fighting against uh, the state, sometimes the, the state is in the NGOs already. And so uh, that, that's, that, that's all this is not really involved in this boomerang um, idea. And getting closer to what uh, to, to my focus, the EU is basically in the same 2000s, it, it became um, increasingly clear in at least one part of the literature is that that basically the EU and focused on Eastern Europe um, has become a major influencer um, for and also a major force for for NGOs, um, particularly in those countries which had a, the off, had had a chance to become EU members. Um, and this was this has a huge literature um, which uh, which looks at all kinds of policies. And there is also lit so basically saying that EU integration or the hope of EU integration affected all kinds of levels uh, on the policy level, but also at different actors, including civil society. And then if you look at this, this literature, which has emerged basically combining this EU focus on and, and the literature, which is more in the IR, uh, as I said, coming from countries like Indonesia, if you merge this and uh, there, there, there were quite some debates in the uh, emerging in, around that time, um, and they, they were basically or, um, centering around the question whether what does external aid do to uh, to civil society to local civil society and one one part of the literature um, like Adam Fagan for example argues that well what happens here is with grassroots organizations so grassroots civil society is that that basically external aid is really dangerous it, it transforms grassroots organizations into astroturf basically uh, it, uh, it makes them um, donor dependent it, uh, it, 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 it tra totally transforms their internal log logic and what is even more dangerous it, it cuts them away from their roots so that and probably all of you have heard about these this, uh, organizations somewhere which are basically catering to external donors um, and um, and are basically repeating um, um, like a parrot like what what th those donors want and no matter what those policies which they're promoted are particularly they can do everything um, in a way uh, external donors really like these because they're very efficient um, and others also more more on the critical sides were saying that yes this happens but what what happens also is is, is professionalization so there is a maybe this the, the, exactly this astroturf groups are professionalizing like crazy. So this is the you know, external help leaves the cha gives the chance for some organizations to, to organize well. To, but of course, to, to manage projects, you need structures, you need bureaucracy, you need skills. So, um, so basically, this professionalization comes at the same time with, with project, projectification. What is projectification? I think this is a very important uh, aspect, which is basically uh, Organizational sociologists are have, have been looking at, at been looking at companies. Organi project application is is the idea that that you you don't really have long time budgets. You have funding for maybe two years. That's already quite long. You have usually for for some months, and you have to um, to work to get the, the next funding. And this is of course um, very very problematic for long time planning. Um, and if you Bring this together with this astroturf idea, uh, which I mentioned first. That this get, gets gets sort of a, a really a problem, which uh, it, in a way, at least some of these people would say, ar is, has arrested civil society because they couldn't really do what they what they want, but they were doing what what those uh, donors uh, in through their projects were um, uh, were suggesting. So there is some great work on on this line. Kovac and Kucharova were were the first who were looking at, at agricultural uh, projects uh, and uh, and agricultural um, 
civil society more or less. But then there is, of course, another uh, part of the literature saying that, no, no, this is not really that bad. You know, like pro this professionalization is, a, in, in a sense, is, is maybe it's bad, bad but, in, but it's, it's necessary. You have to do that. Um, and and um, on the Chistar, for example, says that, you know, like those, those guys who get a lot of external funding are actually those who are really effective and they they, they are they are active uh, and they, they they can bring their policies through so they are in a sense they it, it, it makes sense uh, of course there are some who, who don't get such funding but but you know that we, we shouldn't really uh, think that this is this is, in general this is a a, a, a bad um um, uh, something bad is happening in general it, it looks quite uh, quite well so there is there are these this two opposing view in the literature, uh, and then there is also a complementary uh, thing which which Sitaro, um, uh, um, Petrova brought together, where we say that well basically both are both views are true, so we need both, and we do, we shouldn't really look at, at civil society as being very uh, unified. So we need their argument is we need basically grassroots, and we need other types of of, of civil society actors which are they, something they call transactional. We would probably call it here more transnational or transnationalized as well. So those are those guys who, who can connect, who can connect the grassroots with the international sphere because they say like, yeah, these donors are very important. Um, um, grassroots are very important as well, but they need somebody to, to make the, the tie between. And, and some, some organizations are spe specializing on this, uh, on, on connecting. Uh, some, the, the re really big ones can do everything. They can basically do um, do the uh, transactional and the participatory um, um, part as well, and and I think this is they, they developed this uh, actually an environmental policy in, uh, in 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 Eastern Europe. But I think this general model can be well used in in probably in, in many other fields where you are working on. Think of uh, um, I don't know migration NGOs and so on. So this is one view on on uh, like some important deba debates in this in, in this literature. Um, I, I think some of the confusion, um, if, if you look at let this more conceptually, is uh, is that um, it within this literature is not really differentiated what what kind of actors are the units of analysis. Um, so of course you have probably this. this uh, by now, have heard about all these discussions about what an NGO is, how it uh, how it's different to a social movement, a civil society, or a campaign. So this literature tends to confund everything. So some are, some are looking at campaigns, others are looking at civil society, uh, organize like others look are looking at organizations, um, and and it's probably fair to say that these these actors tend to have very different strategies, per se, or already per per let's let per per. Burst, I would say. Um, so it doesn't. It, it, this this is related to their identity very often, also to their self perception, and not necessarily only to external um, influence. So, in a way, it, this literature I, I, I cited before, or at least part of that, can be criticized by saying that okay, they they are totally focusing on this external um, aspect of it, and in the in the end, many of these NGOs we are looking at. Uh, are, they just don't really bother about this external influence. So they they were there probably before. Um, they they do something which is which this external aspect is maybe important, maybe not so much. Um, so it's 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 a bit overdoing things of saying that yeah we should we should look at this through this external influence uh, perspective. And then this is there is also one one other. Uh, conceptual issue, I think, which is this literature is not, not really clear on, on it, at least, is that um, how we measure civil society or social movement influence. So you probably know here, here the, the literature um, um, on how, like how, how difficult this is. Um, so what is uh, the impact of a social movement? Think of uh, the climate movement. We can think of this uh, in, in, in many different ways. Is it, but do we measure this in, in terms of laws? Or do we measure it in in change of attitudes in the, within the population? Or um, the other question is, of course, uh, if we get deeper into this sort of dependent variable problem, is um, um, you know how how long is is our time perspective? So is it 
do we expect from from Fridays for Future that it should have an impact within a year, a two, five, ten? Um, so what what is our, our our measurement? And and this this applies as well for for many of these these uh, movements, environmental movements, um, which were um, which were analyzed. Usually they were pretty pretty short term in short term perspective um, and and by now as time has passed we see that you know the, the effects are looking pretty different um, they sometimes they they had some policies and they disappeared afterwards or, or it can also go the other way so time is always and this is more like the, the, the methodological um, sort of uh, uh, idea or, or, or point I, I want to make is it's important to look at things in a long-term perspective and then of course effects are also important to look at also because uh, um, there are also side effects. So do we look at, at uh, you know, what the, the effect of one policy? Is it implemented or not? But it might be also some something else happening just in between, which it wasn't really the idea of the external donor, but it nevertheless happens. So these are just some conceptual points. And what I'm, I want to sort of suggest here is, uh, is, is bringing together social movement perspectives and this book by, by McAdam and um, McCarthy and Zold, which you probably know, or I don't know if you know it in that form, if you still go to library, but, um, but this, you know, like this are those three very classic perspectives uh, of, uh, of social movement studies. And, and basically, I think it's, it's not that difficult to, to say that, you know, we can easily bring this together with external influence and saying that external influence can be analyzed along, along these three, per, three uh, perspectives. And of course, there, there is a lot of work on one of these perspectives. But I, I actually, I think that, that it's, it's fair to say that it, it, it would be sort of good and comprehensive to bring those aspects together uh, and, and look, at, um, uh, look at external influence um, in a comprehensive way. So, Political opportunity structures. What 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 happens there? Uh, we look, you, you know, like all this this classics uh, by Kitchell and, uh, and and so on. And like looking at which kind of allies does the movement have in the system? Is how open is the political system? And so on. And, and of course, if we look at and this is sort of our uh, interest a bit is like political systems are uh, in particular in, in half auto authoritarian or, or transitional states are not necessarily the same ones than 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 Kitchell than these people were thinking of so so we have, still need to have to make some adjustments on on what would be a functional equivalent to parties or to to an open legal system uh, which which is uh, um, like all this litigation literature um, is, is is suggesting so what do you do if uh, if the uh, if, if courts are uh, are not free um, you just cannot have that as a as an opportunity, a legal opportunity structure, um, and and need to see like okay maybe there are other ways how how these these organizations are are still getting their uh, their say. Resources I think is is pretty straightforward, and we could sort of in this external um, uh, influence perspective could look at what kind of resources are coming from. Us, from abroad or from externally, but of course matching that with what is already there, because it's as I said, it's not not always, and this is I think a, a major problem in this literature is saying that well everything is coming from from outside. There there are a lot of capacities which are existing there, and uh, and in, in and for most of the uh, organizations uh, we were looking at, I mean this EU funds for example or external funds were were something nice. Um, and it, and it also gave gave the chance to connect, but they were far from being the only on the only thing. And then, of course, you have to look what 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 is available nationally, at least in the East European countries. By now, national funding is at least for those NGOs who are on the on the good side, politically, uh, is much higher than than what what is coming from the EU. Um, also, business funding increased. So. This is something which, uh, which, which is an external perspective, has, has very strongly this thing that, okay, international organizations, international donors, foundations are sort of the main thing. It's not necessarily, the, I think it wasn't really true in the heydays either, but it's, it's less and less so um, now. But of course, there are countries where, where um, and particularly in the um, neighborhood countries um, in, and, and also in the MENA uh, region where, where actually, 
external funding is the only chance to to to, to get along. Um, so that that needs to be differentiated as well. And of course, uh, the third part of the triptych, so to say, of, of uh, social movement studies is is this idea of frames matter. Um, and of course, this is about also about discourses, how to how how. We, how, how policies or, or, or how this external influence itself is made, how, is the, how sense is given. And of course, one big tradition in this research is to, to look look at, uh, at discourses from, of, of, of these organizations. And of course, this frame uh, discourse analysis is a, is a big family or a big church. Um, so there, there, there could be, um, there, there are many, uh, many ways of, of dealing with that. Um, Starting from, or maybe ending with, um, the Foucauldian perspectives, uh, but also they're probably more, uh, also like easier and uh, uh, more superficial ways of, of looking at, at, at discourses. Uh, but but I think this is this is also something which which gives really a lot of um, context, which uh, which which some of these other perspectives are missing. Um, Okay, so just one um, slide about just contextualizing environmentalism in Eastern Europe, and uh, I'm, I will then um, have I still have I think two two slides, but then then we'll lead over um, to to the to the main act. Uh, but I think it's 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 important to see that uh, environmentalism in, in Eastern Europe didn't emerge uh, without any history, um, and it's of course it, it has a, ver a heritage, a strong heritage of, of of the, in the last 20 years of, first of all, of very rapid and very heavy uh, industrialization. Um, and actually, the, in the 80s, that's also like what by, by now contemporary historians are doing more and more and covering the protests um, of, of the 80s. And they say that, um, well, environmental protests in the 80s were, were, were actually quite big. Um, and and they, they, they were against the environmental problems which this rapid uh, heavy industrialization has has created, and they were in a way the first contestations of an author of this authoritarian regimes because even the authoritarian regimes couldn't say that they are against the nature. Um, so in a way, this the, the environment became a, 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 a place where protest could be carried out. It couldn't be carried out if it was about Free, ele free elections or democracy and so on, but environment, which is in many ways connected, of course, um, to, to, to those issues, um, was, was a niche which uh, could be used. And then in the 90s, we had a sort of a natural cleanup um, uh, through heavy de-industrialization here. So basically, what, what in political economy, we see that you know, a lot of uh, all these old heavy polluting factories have closed in a way that made... Um, made uh, Air better and water cleaner, but not for long, because um, because then we we also had in the 90s basically starting this this transition from from basically what we could say like com from communism to consumerism. So basically adopting the same patterns of of consume which were there in Western Europe, and and this this were in a sense also part of the um, of the um, of the hope of you know getting into the EU. Be, and being able to consume the same way like those in the EU are are, are doing, and and then around the same time we we had the this the ever stronger impact in, in Eastern Europe on on um, on, on of, of EU integration coming with 200 environmental laws. So basically, these countries, in order to get into the club, had to adopt all these legislations so have the same legislation like uh, in environmental issues where, uh, like like. The Western European member states. Um, so it, this was obviously good for for environmental policy uh, in in these countries, but of course this same process was also very ambivalent because it opened the markets and it opened the markets for FDI influx. It opened the market in the end for for uh, for reindustrialization. Um, so from if, if you're following political economy, also from my colleagues here at SNS, I mean this this was the the time when. Uh, and basically, these countries, many of them at least, became the the prolonged workbench of Western European factories. And this came, of course, obviously with uh, uh, with its environmental um, issues. And the 2010s probably 
fair to say that with emerging life quality as well, and in a way, in a very Engelhartian way, um, there was, uh, we, we also see large scale environmental protests re emerging, mostly in the Balkans, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, where, where we see, and we will, that will be also part of the story. Um, I guess um, is that that environmental protests are are are, are re-emerging, and they are emerge in in some contexts, like in Hungary, um, even if they are not not strong. But but again, like in a full circle of against an, an increasingly authoritar authoritarizing state. So um, I'm I said in the beginning that I'm 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 having this this four um, four cases. Um, I, I won't really go into them, but um, just saying some some ideas of uh, about each of these uh, um, case study in in in, in, a, in a sense um, is that um, well the interesting part about in, in the in the first in, in, from from this perspective of transnationalization was that, that it always went together with either strong transnationalization but also capacity building um, about but the EU and and this in the first case, which is like a more general, general case, like what happened to, to civil society during EU accession in the new member states is what we see that there, during the accession period, there was a very strong influx of resources, strong frames, strong, uh, basically the political opportunity structures have changed to the good of, of the civil society actors. What happened afterwards is, is also more interesting, probably, also because it's much much closer. So in a way, we see a, a closing again. Uh, so the, the the chance was actually it's hard to say to the people who were there in in uh, the, the the chance was before accession to to get something done or or just very briefly afterwards. And many many were hoping that you know once we are in, everything will turn turn nice. And after they got in, they basically just realized that, well, they are in the same market for uh, for uh, for resources where they compete with many other NGOs from Western Europe, which are technically well, much better um, in, in, in doing stuff. So it, in a way, this peripheralization, which we see in, in, in the political economy in general, um, can be seen here as well. Um, the other thing, like, other vignettes, so to say, of a case study is this uh, um, this one of my uh, sort of pet projects with this Russia Montana anti mining uh, issue is that this is actually a an, an interesting case where where very weak gr groups locally organized and and connected with with international help and made made this story a big story um, basically without really much EU help or there at some point it was even against it but the interesting part was to to use the, those parts of the of the eu accession which were talking to this so it, it could have been used against in you know like there were uh, canadian foreign investors coming in the eu accession was about opening the market letting them in but what what basically provided these groups a a, a, a very effective weapon was, was were were Issue, like policies like the environmental impact assessment, for example, where you can you have to lay open uh, the, all those plans which uh, which uh, you know like um, you have with the uh, with, with these investments or or the projects and and this this were this was basically real, such a long process that at some point the uh, um, it, it basically got, came to the stand to a standstill for so it's it's not really clear also after 15 years whether this project will will really work uh, but but it became less and less of a good economic case also of course other issues came in as well so global all uh, gold prices play a role um, same same as we see now with with uh, oil and gas so that's really you know the global price makes a difference um just the last point is, which is maybe a bit of a, on a more negative um, tone, and, and to 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 finish is that. Um, so we were looking also at environmental protest in Hungary, and you know Hungary uh, being a lot of news by in terms of, you know the the first full fledged um, illiberal country in a sense, and civil and this has a very strong impact also on civil society, and and in a way we would have expected that um, that this. This would lead also again, like 30 years ago, to, to protests and, and basically uniting around issues which are not so political. So basically environmental urban conflicts would provide the chance of 
to, to do this transactionary and the participatory part together. Um, but what we see is that it's not happening. So basically, this this this, this politicization of the of, of civil society um, is, is is in a sense. Um, Stopping uh, this this groups organizing on the on the local level of reaching out um, uh, to to other groups internationally, um, but also to other ones. So so basically, the local groups just stay there and fight within each other, and they don't really reach out in either to Greenpeace or or like the the, the the bigger sort of transaction reactors, but they just keep keep the protests local. Also, because being afraid of you know like. Politicizing the conflict might uh, might hurt hurt them and and also might drive away supporters. So this is in a way a a, a problem of political opportunity structures which are closed, but they're so closed that, that these organizations are are so muted that they cannot really use them anymore because they uh, they, they they just simply lack the resources and the the context has changed so much that it, it's. Uh, um, so basically, protest is not working in that that context any, anymore, which is, in a way, bad news in general for protest under illiberal um, in, in, in illiberal um, flags. Okay, so this is what I what I have, and 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 basically what what we in general I, I would tend to say that dual strategies, uh, this transnationalization, but also having local roots uh, works works best, um, and. Lasting successes need need to have some some kind of mm. local support in order to to be anchored. So usually, if we if we just had um, successful policy initiatives, even but uh, if there was wasn't really meaningful support on the local level, um, like I said, you because you should we should look at at, at uh, policy success in the long term perspective. So if we, if we look tend to look at this ten years later, many of these policies just didn't really um, really happen. Then. Um, the other thing, things I, I, I want to uh, to uh, to give with you, give 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 you on your road um, in, in research is that is, is are, are more conceptual um, and basically I, I pointed to some of the myopias in in in, uh, in researching external influences. So I think this this is very important to to, to look and and some of the methods I I think that which which should be um, um, used a lot or more uh, are, are this, in a way, longitudinal and ethnographic perspectives also teamed up in a sense with organizational perspectives. So, yeah, I'm. This is just a very broad overview. We're, get, we're getting to the main act, but uh, I hope that you can you, you can sort of have some of these ideas, uh, you know, reflected at least in in, in your um, own research, which I'm. I think it's not necessarily about the environment, but uh, maybe it, it relates in some way to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Arne, for this main act. <laughs> I will very much uh, rely on my presentation, things that you have pointed out. So, uh, hello, my name is Jelena Peršić, I'm coming from University of Belgrade, Faculty of Philosophy, and together with my colleague Elisaveta Mukilic, which is present uh, here via Zoom, uh, I will actually uh, talk about potentials for transnationalization of grassroots environmental movements in India. And much of this uh, presentation actually relies on the research that we have conducted within the Trapoco project, and we have published it in a paper, European Intention from Below at the Semi Periphery, the Movement Against Small Hydropower Plants. So, uh, what will be the aim of this presentation? Actually, to see what are the potentials and obstacles for transnationalization of these grassroots initiatives. And I will very much rely on a, a Movement Against Small Hydropower Plant, which was uh, actually emerging in recent years in Serbia, but also to some other initiatives as well. And uh, my uh, presentation will follow three major points. 
first point is why we talk about transnationalization in the context of Europeanization. So why is uh, uh, transnationalization e why, why, why transnationalization equals Europeanization, and why is the EU accession uh, process actually the key uh, contextual factor in understanding uh, emergence and uh, uh, development of transnationalization of these initiatives? But also, I will also reflect uh, uh, on the one other contradictory thing. Why is the EU accession uh, process main, one of the main culprits for the uh, environment, environmental conflicts? My second point is going to be uh, uh, introduction of maybe wider contextual factor, and that is the perspective of semi-periphery. And within this context, I will uh, introduce the concept of environmentalism of the poor or environmentalism of dispossessed. And my third point is going to be related to socialist heritage and uh, why is socialist heritage relevant for explanation of uh, potentials and obstacles for transnationalization of these initiatives. So uh, just to go briefly through different paths of transnationalization, I suppose that all, you, all of you all already know them. So this would be, as Delaporte and Tyro recognize, diffusion, domestication, externalization and transnationalization in a narrow sense. So the fusion actually uh, relates to international circulation of uh, ideas, tactics, and repertoires of action. Domestication uh, 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 implies adoption of international goals, ideas, and practices at national level. Externalization is related to addressing uh, to international actors with intention to on influencing uh, national governments. And transnationalization, in a narrow sense, actually implies uh, uh, coordination of protests uh, uh, and other activities uh, aimed at international organization and uh, corporations. Now, uh, let me start with the first point, Europeanization and transnationalization. Uh, how are these two processes actually connected? So I will start with this claim of uh, De La Porta and Kayani that Europeanization represents a regional form of globalization, at least for this part of the world. So process of European integration uh, uh, very much implies uh, harmonization of different legislations, policies, institutional arrangements between different countries, and most of the EU countries actually have harmonized their laws, but uh, countries which are candidate countries have really uh, still much things to do in that respect, as Aaron uh, already noted. So in terms of uh, Europeanization as a context of domestication of environmental struggles, uh, uh, first of all, process of EU accession means actually adoption of different environmental legislation and implementation of policies and European directives. And uh, one such directive is actually uh, related to transition to renewable sources of energy, uh, which is one of the priorities of European Commission, which is uh, uh, formulated within European Green Deal. And it means actually transformation of EU economies and uh, other economies towards uh, climate neutrality. So as the candidate country, Serbia is obliged to harmonize its legislation and practices uh, in, uh, comply in to comply, comply with the uh, environmental acquis. Uh, however, EU accession process is not only about uh, uh, harmonizing laws, but it is also about raising awareness on, in, on the importance of environmental issues and about building uh, civil sector capacities who will work continuously on these issues. And in this sense, we can say that the EU represents the main external source of development of environmental new government or uh, non-government organizations. However, Europeanization process is not without uh, its contradictions. So uh, some of them were actually pointed out, and uh, that is that they, uh, it is primarily oriented towards building capacities of professional NGOs through external inputs of foreign donations. And although EU accession process put forward envir environmental issues within public discourse, uh, since they are being uh, externally imposed as part of the EU negotiation process and without meaningful link to everyday experience of citizens, these issues were very much lacking resonance among citizens. Um, of course, much of the criticism has, be addre has been addressed to professional uh, activism, that they are drone-driven, interested in project funds and not in the needs of citizens, that they are not authentic, that they, they are ineffective, they then, they do, that they do not, do not have capacity for making changes and they are depoliticizing their activities, that they are devoid of any agency. And in this sense, EU external government actually strengthens the civil sector on one side, but also at, th at the same time, it hijacks, or as Aaron said, captures uh, environmental issues. 
So uh, what happened in Serbia uh, and how these uh, uh, protests against small hydropower plant emerged? As I said, Serbia has been obliged to uh, reduce the emission of CO2 by transferring to renewable sources of energy. And since being rich in mountainous river, uh, small hydropower plants were actually recognized as one of the sources of this clean energy. And in 2006, it ratified the Energy Community Treaty, which was followed by a number of changes in national legislation. And of course, it was also followed by a number of financial incentives, which were offered by uh, European Bank for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, for bank for for reconstruction and development, the European Investment Bank. And uh, uh, it is actually the moment when uh, the Ministry of Energy in 2013 organized a public tender uh, for the construction of small hydropower plants. And uh, uh, it was planned that it has to be built on, uh, in, on 317 locations. Um, apart from these incentives that came from uh, European institutions, also uh, foreign banks which are operating in Serbia also offered favorable loans for this construction. And the state also committed to buy electricity at preferential prices over a period of 12 years. That means that actually it was very profitable activity for those who uh, entered this kind of construction. And uh, 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 as in the Western Balkans always happens, local authority granted these necessary permissions, but uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, with the lack of control and lack of uh, uh, compliance with the law. So it was actually very, uh, it was the case that most of these uh, uh, construction uh, laws, uh, 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 most of these construction permissions actually were uh, actually obtained through uh, different kind of uh, corruptive activities. And here on the map, uh, I don't know if you can see, uh, there is a map of these uh, uh, planned and uh, uh, construction, so uh, construction of small hydropower plant. The red dots actually represent planned locations and the blue dot represents uh, the actual locations where they were they have been built. Uh, so these were mostly locations in southeast and southwest Serbia. This was it, it, these are locations which actually uh, uh, belong to rural areas. Uh, which are suffering from depopulation and from economic underdevelopment. And most, mo some of them actually were built in protected nature parks. So in terms of population who was suffering from this, these were poor, poor communities, actually. Most of these uh, economic activity, activities of this uh, uh, population actually depend on natural resources, such as they, they do agriculture, livestock, fishing, forestry, ecological tourism. So uh, the construction of small hydro actually left them without uh, sufficient water supplies for their own agricultural activities. And uh, of course, uh, this construction was uh, uh, followed by different debates within the country. Uh, there were arguments in favor and arguments against this, small uh, against this construction. So arguments in favor were actually related to the fact that uh, through these constructions, local community would benefit through job creation, through increased tax revenues, or through uh, access to cheaper electricity. Uh, arguments against were actually that uh, these are remotely controlled uh, hydropower plants, so that means that they are not uh, creating uh, really much jobs. Uh, secondly, that incentives that are paid by the government are much higher than tax revenues, so the, this argument of taxes is also not valid. And thirdly, that uh, 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 these are actually low potential, uh, low capacity hydropower plants. It means that they are not really producing much energy. And it was estimated that uh, uh, if all the plants, hydro plant, hydropower plants would be built, that they could not produce more than 3% of needed electricity. So actually, it was a question whether the benefits from them uh, are actually uh, 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 good enough uh, because we, uh, the, the destruction of the nature that happened was uh, uh, really much, uh, really huge. So what was the consequence of this uh, construction is uh, that uh, it has produced ecological conflicts. And uh, uh, actually what is important that for the first time in several years, it activated an inhabitants of local communities which were actually not really uh, uh, active uh, in any of the protests until then. So these were not people who are coming from urban areas, but uh, people who are living in villages. And initially they had no resources at their disposal. They were poor communities without material resources, without education, without social capital. They had no experience in political struggles and no organizational platforms uh, through which they can work. 
so uh, the, these struggles actually started as local rebellion against small hydro, but uh, what is interesting is that they managed to outgrow this local context to scale up to the national level and even to transnationalize in some extent. So if we put it in a Europe Europeanization process context, we can see that these environmental initiatives actually spread beyond donor-driven NGOs, that Europeanization process indirectly uh, actually activated these grassroots, grassroots environmental initiatives and linked environmental issues with real concerns of the citizens. And in some extent, we can say that it, it was non-intended consequence of implementation of European green policies. My second point is the point uh, uh, related to Europeanization as uh, externalization. As we can see, civil society networks can use uh, and can be can can use uh, different mechanisms to participate in planning, implementing, and monitor EU, EU policy. Also, they can connect with uh, each other, and they can actually have have possibilities to to complain to Brussels, to put pressure on their governments through European institutions or, or by mobilizing public opinion of EU countries. However, uh, environmental organizations coming from post-socialist countries have lower potential to influence decision-making process. And if you uh, uh, can imagine Western Balkan countries, which are still in candidate position, they even has less potentials to do uh, do uh, do something like that. Uh, and even more, even more complex situation is related to these local environmental initiatives, which are grassroots grassroots movement, because they have minimal poten coalition potential and minimal resources to uh, create alliances, both nationally and internationally. So the question is, how this movement against small hydro actually managed to transnationalize, given that they started as grassroots initiative of resource poor uh, rural res uh, poor, poor uh, residents of rural areas. So we'll try to give some answers to that and to point to some strategies that they used. First of all, they were addressing their local concerns to international and regional NGOs, which were specialized in protection of the river and flora and fauna. And they were operating globally, but also in the Western Balkan region. So these were organizations such as Save the Blue Heart of Euro Europe, River Watch, Bank Watch, Worldwide Fund for Nature. Nature, and they actually initiated a number of uh, actions toward institutions of European Commission, such as writing petitions, writing protest letters, and so on. But also they uh, uh, provided expert knowledge uh, to local initiatives since they funded a number of studies which uh, were uh, relating to uh, related to uh, pointing to the effects of the piping of the rivers on the natural habitat and local communities. And then these local initiatives could use this expert knowledge in order to mobilize uh, citizens in their national context. Secondly, they sought after and got the help from local experts, which were mostly active uh, in academia and interested in preservation of rivers, wildlife, natural habitat. They also served as uh, some sort of the uh, activists, activists which mobilized uh, internally uh, public opinion. But on the other hand, they also had another um, Another uh, role, they served as transnational na transnationalizing agents. Uh, just to give an example, the European Tribunal of, uh, for the Defense of Aquatic Ecosystem, which was launched by the European Hub of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, is a global organization which is holding hearings all, uh, about different uh, cases of environmental disasters, disasters all over the world. world. But in 2021, they were holding hear, held hearing about uh, the case of Balkan rivers and the number of experts, uh, mostly biologists, presented their cases. Some of them all were also from Serbia and they presented the case of Koponik mountain river. And what is interesting that uh, the, the, this tribunal, which is actually a non-government organization, concluded that the most uh, responsible for destruction of the of this biodiversity, uh, they pointed out to the government of Republic of Serbia, but also to European Commission. Uh, the third strategy is uh, was related to building of uh, the resources on their own. But as I said, these were scattered small poor communities, which were actually didn't have any 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 kind of political experience. But what they did is that they uh, tried to uh, organize horizontally to create a network of these communities. And most successful case was the uh, case of the community of uh, Stara Planina Mountain. They created a network which is called Let's Defend the Rivers of Stara Planina. 
and together, of course, not only that they horizontally tied, but also they uh, uh, tied to uh, different NGOs which were operating in Serbia until then, mostly in urban struggles. And they managed to create a network of organizations that uh, gain uh, public visibility and recognition. Uh, and uh, not only that, but they actually uh, managed to uh, put this issue, local issue of, lo of small hydro, as a national issue of uh, as an issue which 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 came really national political uh, political uh, which came to national political agenda. So in this way, actually, by networking, they managed to increase their uh, initial potential and to increase the, their coalition potential as well. Uh, and finally, they were using uh, favorable political opportunity structure in order to uh, 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 to gain uh, also visibility. And uh, this uh, uh, this use of utilization of favorable political opportunity structure was uh, actually happened at two levels. One is national because they related to mass protest against authoritarian tendencies of Serbian regime in 2019 and 2020. And actually, they linked these their local issues with the mass discontent of citizens by the unresponsiveness of political and other institutions to the needs of citizens. And uh, what happened is that these were actually first out of many ecological and environmental protests that, that triggered a number of other protests that happened against air pollution in Belgrade and elsewhere. But most importantly, uh, the a large outpour of discontent of people at the streets, uh, uh, which happened uh, uh, against, uh, which happened in fall of 2021, and uh, 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 it was uh, actually related to the uh, lithium mine uh, in Yadar Valley, which has to, be, which is going to be launched or is supposed to be launched by company Rio Tinto. So uh, I can say that uh, this uh, uh, environmental initiative, which was related to the uh, to the struggle against small hydro, actually. Uh, for the first time, uh, uh, created such context that environmental issues could be uh, uh, framed in this in such way that they could uh, resonate among general population. And uh, what happened is that actually these environmental issue, initiatives uh, uh, had really huge mobilization for potential for mass uh, protest at the streets. And as I said, they uh, they they use favorable political opportunity structure in two levels. The second level is related to the uh, actually Europeanization process. Uh, Serbia is a candidate country, but it is also suffering uh, from democratic backsliding for such uh, some years. And of course, it is also in the process of stagnation of uh, EU accession. And uh, this fact, fact is actually exploited by addressing to the Brussels and by linking the issue of uh, the construction of small hydro with corruption and with both the implementation of European directives on the use of in, uh, renewable energy. So in this sense, we can say that Europeanization uh, actually represents political opportunity structure for non-state actors to transcend their national authority level and to expand their maneuvering space to influence national authorities via, via European institutions. And that, that is something that, that Arons, Arons uh, mentioned. It is a kind of boomerang effect. Um, the second uh, uh, path of transnationalization is related to the uh, problem of diffusion. Uh, so in diffusion means circulation of ideas. And in the case of this rebellion against most hydro in Serbia, two types of actors were actually really uh, important in this kind of uh, transnationalization uh, path. The first one is related to regional context of Western Balkan and uh, in horizontal networking of different initiatives all over the region. Uh, as I said, most of the Western Balkan states, apart from Croatia, are still in different phases of the accession process to EU. And all of them are, are faced with same requirements concerning harmonization of the legislation and implementation of EU policies. And uh, when it comes to small hydro, Serbia was not an exception because the, the same incentives uh, were actually happened elsewhere. Uh, and uh, being rich uh, of torrential rivers, uh, small hydro were built throughout the whole region, Bosnia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Albania, Macedonia. And also it was leaving almost the same consequences as in Serbia, the destruction of natural habitat and daily livelihood of local communities, but also it triggered a mass discontent of local population, uh, uh, which enabled actually to uh, these initiatives to to connect to each other uh, somehow to uh, make horizontal ties bet between them to to give each other support or even to uh, be present at uh, uh, protest of each other. 
However, I have to say that uh, although this was something that was actually uh, present as potential, I can I have the feeling that it was not really fully exploited, that it could be exploited even more in the future struggles. And uh, second, the second or uh, the second uh, uh, actor was uh, which was important here in diffusion process was actually international civil organization that I have already mentioned. They had multiple roles. Uh, the first one was coordination of joint actions toward the institution of European Commission, and they uh, they they tar targeted transnational institutions such as European Commission or European Bank for Construction and Development. And uh, in this sense, they actually internationalized the issue of small hydro. It was not the local NGOs that do that, but this international organization that managed to do this. Uh, also, they served as major hubs for knowledge production on these adverse effects of the small hydro on local communities. And by networking with local NGOs and with grassroots initiatives, they actually provided much needed infrastructural support for these protests. Okay. Not sure what happened, but. Yeah, but uh, it's not moving. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Transnationalization, in narrow sense, is maybe the least exploited uh, strategy uh, and uh, um, the least developed, may, mostly because uh, the small hydro issue represents mostly local and regional problems. So there are a number of these installations all over Europe, for example, in Germany, Italy, France, Sweden, but uh, these adverse uh, environmental effects were not present as in the case of Western Balkans, mostly because the, their implementation has been followed by, uh, by much stricter control and uh, regu uh, regulated by in environmental legislature, legislature, legislation which were present there. So in this case, they actually didn't invoke any kind of uh, protest as it was in, uh, the case uh, in, of Western Balkans. And in this case, sense, we can say that the small hydro issue does not have a uh, really sufficient potential to be fully transnationalized. They can, these questions can be and they were internationalized, but it is actually a question whether they can invoke uh, some kind of broader action at the European level. So let me now go to the second major point, and it is the perspective of semi-periphery uh, and environmentalism of the poor. So this context of semi-periphery is uh, another perspective from which we can actually think about potentials for grassroots environmentalism. Uh, environmental justice perspective actually puts forward issues of, of unequal distribution of environmental hazards, which are redistributed globally to underdeveloped countries. And most of the developing developed countries actually get uh, seeks to get rid of dirty technology or to transfer to renew, renewable sources sources of energy. But uh, eco ecological costs are borne by communities that uh, are uh, to uh, to which these these technologies are moving or which are suffering from implementation of the green policies uh, on the global north. So in this sense, global expansion of, expansion of capital accumulation is accompanied by uh, different special forms of environmental activism, which is uh, uh, initially called environmentalism of the poor, and it was related to indigenous communities in Latin America and India. Uh, but in recent years, years this, this term was expanded to environmentalism of dispossessed. And it uh, implies politici politicization of environmentalism that arises between the needs of, of, of expanded capitalist accumulation at the global level and local resistances, not only to material or economic or ecological destruction, but also to the loss of political sovereignty. I'm not meaning only sovereignty on national level, but sovereignty of local communities to be involved in decision making process about this kind of uh, initiatives. So in this sense, we can uh, really uh, uh, follow Torgerson, which is uh, which says that plurality of transnationalization of environmental activism should include uh, uh, also these forms of transnational activism that have critical stances toward green policies coming from core capitalist countries, and which are actually reproducing these patterns of global inequalities. 
uh, what happened in uh, uh, Eastern European or Western Balkan state is that this eco eco uh, ecological modernization approach implies that economic growth is a precondition for environmental uh, and social progress. So you cannot access uh, in EU uh, if you're not really economically developed to, in, certain, in, cert in certain aspects. So uh, it means that uh, it invokes restructuring of, of econ economy that actually increases the risks of ecological hazards for these countries. And in such situations, in most of the, uh, in most of the times, uh, uh, the logic of profit actually prevails over the logic of protection of environment. Also, environmental uh, disasters can actually happen due, due to application of green technologies. As I have mentioned, the small hydro issue actually, it was uh, uh, the aim was to reduce uh, the emission of CO2, uh, not only at uh, the level of Euro European Union, but also in countries which are neighboring European Union, meaning Western Balkans. So they had to, uh, to, to transform to, to these uh, uh, alternative energy sources and they choose small hydro. And small hydro actually left huge eco ecological impact on these communities where they were constructed. Another, uh, another, another uh, example is example of uh, uh, use of electric batteries. The, the, it, it is something that uh, is important uh, if you want to uh, uh, use uh, to, to, to cut the, the CO2 uh, emission. But these electric batteries are actually requiring lithium. Lithium is relatively uh, uh, it is an it is an ore that it is not really uh, common. So if you want environmental environmental friendly lithium mining, uh, it is something which is expensive. So these companies which actually uh, sought to exploit this ore in countries in which environmental regulation are not developed, and that is something which happened to Serbia with the coming of Rio Tinto company uh, launching the lithium mine in Yadar Valley and also it sparked new environmental conflicts, maybe the biggest conflicts until now. And uh, they had some uh, temporary success because the government uh, uh, for the time being cut the negotiations with Rio Tinto, but uh, it will, I suppose, continue. Final uh, final point is socialist heritage. Uh, as I said, uh, said uh, so there is uh, actually, uh, we have to have in mind that uh, we have to be cautious when interpreting uh, different environmental movements which are arising from different social contexts. So Jelicka and Jakobson actually uh, uh, claimed that much of the scholarship on post-socialist environmental has been actually interpreted from this Western perspective or uh, based on a models which were, uh, uh, which were uh, based on uh, forms and experiences of Western environmental politics and, uh, and activism. And this warning actually also can be uh, applied when we are talking about potentials for transnationalization of these movements. So Jelicka and Jakobson actually uh, are pointing to some specificities of environmental act activism in post-socialist country, which invokes the socialist heritage. And that is this continuity between uh, patterns of environmental activism that were present during the socialist period and participatory, participatory policy model which were imported and promoted from the West and that were aimed uh, 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 to building a civil, si civil society uh, that happened after the socialism. So it doesn't mean that there were no environmental activi act act activism uh, during socialism, but this uh, environmental activism was simply different. Uh, also, these environmental initiatives in socialist and post-socialist countries are not necessarily linked to the issues of social justice, nor they have been actually perceived as part of a single corpus of problems. And thirdly, the forms of environmental activism which were present in post-socialist countries are not necessarily politicized. Often, actually, they rely on everyday practices and lifestyles that include living in harmony with nature without excessive consumption of resources. And uh, we have to have in mind uh, these three things when interpreting uh, potentials for transnationalization in these countries. So if Western model of environmental activism is based on civic engagement and protest policies, uh, Eastern European environmentalism, as uh, Jelicka and Jakobson said, uh, uh, very much rely on a tradition of non-politicized everyday environmentalism. And that is something that we have to have in mind when we think about uh, potentials or why, why there is uh, relatively slower transnationalization of these uh, movements in uh, post-socialist country. But also it is something that could lead, give us a clue why 
in these countries, uh, uh, actually grassroots activism has been so far more successful in mobilizing citizens than it was than the, than professional NGOs. And finally, if I have to make some conclusions, I will start with the uh, maybe bold uh, claim that the environmental risks and problems uh, are not the same in the countries of capitalist center and periphery, although they are interconnected. So environmental initiatives at the periphery can exploit favorable political opportunity structures which are created by uh, EU accession. Uh, in order to internationalize, but it is the question whether they can go fully transnational if uh, these uh, problems which are arising from different contexts are not the same. Secondly, grassroots initiatives have advantage over the professional NGOs because they are forming down around real problems of the citizens, so they have uh, potential to mobilize people who are motivated to keep th these struggles alive. And if political opportunities are favorable, they can leverage their discontent to national level, although in this case they have to build uh, to expand their coalition potential to link with some uh, wider issues, maybe not necessarily envir environmental issues, but other issues. And uh, of course, in order to transnationalize, which is another step, they uh, really need to build closer, uh, closer ties with professional NGOs and with, with international advocacy networks. And finally, Europeanization process actually represents the framework in which green agenda is externally imposed, both creating, both creating situation in which environmental hazards may occur, but at the same time, it is offering mechanisms for local activists to use this accession process in order to uh, put pressure on, the, on their national power holders and to make them to comply with these environmental standards that they adopted. So, thank you. Okay, so we can just so thanks a lot to the for the presentations that I think really were exhaustive and they took to each other. So it was a great introduction that Warren and then we continue to see where the peculiarities of uh, Eastern European environmentalism. So um, I'm really happy for this talk. Aspect like the differences in environmentalism and on social media. Uh, so trying to go beyond this uh, Western perspective. So now we have still uh, 10, 15 minutes for the Q&A. So I welcome everybody to ask question, questions. Uh, I know that some of you are working on the um, on the topic of the environment and environmental movement, and then I mean after the break we will continue the discussion uh, with Alice. She will uh, present uh, the, the paper that uh, Yelena mentioned, so about the thinking central and this European environmentalist, and also this beyond borders. So we will have time to discuss more in depth afterwards about the theoretical part. But if now there are questions from the audience about the empirical case, other aspects of the research, I'm, I'm sure our right on, you want to start since you work on the region and on a similar topic. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I think I think yes. So um, yeah, I will break the ice. I'm very happy and honored uh, to have this opportunity um, to to have you here and to have read your papers and um, and listen to your presentations. Um, First, I wanted to make a general comment uh, that um, it was more a question uh, when like reading your works, but I think 
uh, in your presentations, you both uh, managed to like respond. Um, I think it is uh, it is very useful to to use uh, and to like insert um, a social movements uh, perspective and literature, but also in terms of methodology, because. Um, what I found uh, lacking uh, was uh, sometimes when looking at uh, especially these um, uh, the opportunities and the, the all the contradictions of the EU or external uh, influence um, in Eastern Europe is uh, the lack of an agency oriented approach. So I would uh, like encourage also to continue. Uh, to to look also from the side of the of the grassroots and of the people that uh, are struggling uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, generally speaking, and to stress uh, a lot the strategic aspects of some of the choices. Uh, sometimes, like in my very personal uh, experience and. Uh, recent uh, and initial fieldwork that I'm conducting, I see how much uh, uh, when we look, like when we listen to their point of view, it's really an issue of, uh, yes, of opportunities and of strategic choices um, that are made. Um, so on this aspect, I have a question for Aaron, um, whether you uh, like uh, have some like suggestions or have seen read uh, about also um, different definitions of uh, the NGOs that operate in uh, in Eastern Europe, because uh, I I saw I had the perception that there's also like very big differences among them in their um, potentials also of uh, politic politicization uh, and of uh, uh, whether they're big or small, it uh, it changes a lot, uh, and um, and this can be an aspect if uh, that that can uh, determine whether they actually can uh, foster opportunities for especially grassroots initiatives, or whether they actually contribute to. Um, yeah, to hijacking uh, the the uh, the potentials of the environmentalist uh, struggles, um, especially in relation to like where the state is positioned. So uh, yes, whether their work can actually um, uh, stimulate and um, foster yeah a more political and contentious uh, uh, struggles. Uh, or whether this can create problems, like for the NGOs to to contribute to these uh, to these struggles. I hope I was uh, clear. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I have have an idea of, of that. Let's see whether that matches with what what you were having in mind. So, I mean, I'm not really aware of uh, of, of like something really specific diet, which which should be like on Eastern Europe only. But uh, but I think. Um, if we 